May God be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Grant us, O Lord, to trust in you with all our hearts. For as you always resist the proud who confide in their own strength, so you never forsake those who make their boast of your mercy. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for the reading. A reading from the book of the prophet Jeremiah. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Come, go down to the potter's house, and there I will let you hear my words. So I went down to the potter's house, and there he was working at his wheel. The vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand, and he reworked it into another vessel, as seemed good to him. Then the word of the Lord came to me. Can I not do with you, O house of Israel, just as this potter has done, says the Lord, just like the clay in the potter's hand. So are you in my hand, O house of Israel. At one moment I may declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will pluck up and break down and destroy it. But if that nation, concerning which I have spoken, turns from its evil, I will change my mind about the disaster that I intended to bring on it. And at that, at another moment, I may declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will build and plant it. But if it does evil in my sight, not listening to my voice, then I will change my mind about the good that I had intended to do to it. Now, therefore, say to the people of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, thus says the Lord, look, I am a potter shaping evil against you and devising a plan against you. Turn now, all of you, from your evil way and amend your ways and your doings. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm appointed for today is a portion of Psalm 139. <coughs> Let us pray this psalm together. Lord, you have searched me, search me out and know me. You know my, my sitting, sitting down, down and my rising up. You discern my thoughts from my... afar. You trace my journeys and my resting places and are acquainted with all my ways. Indeed, there is not a word on my lips. But you, O oh Lord, know it all together. You press upon me as I am before, and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain to it. For you yourself created my inmost parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I will thank you because I am marvelously made. Your works are wonderful. And I know it well. My body was not hidden from you, while I was being made in secret and woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my limbs, yet unfinished in the womb. All of them were written in your book. They were fashioned day by day, when as yet there was none of them. How deep I find your thoughts, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I were to count them, they would be more numbered than the sand. To count them all, my lifespan would leave be my life A reading from the letter of Paul to Philemon. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother. To Philemon, our dear friend and co-worker, to Apphia, our sister, to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. When I remember you in my prayers, I always thank my God because I hear of your love for all the saints and your faith toward the Lord Jesus. I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective when you perceive all the good that we may do for Christ. I have indeed received much joy and encouragement from your love, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, my brother. For this reason, 
Though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do your duty, yet I would rather appeal to you on the basis of love. And I, Paul, do this as an old man, and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus. I am appealing to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I have become during my imprisonment. Formerly, he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful both to you and to me. I am sending him, that is, my own heart, back to you. I wanted to keep him with me so that he might be of service to me in your place during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I preferred to do nothing without your consent, in order that your good deed might be voluntary and not something forced. Perhaps this is the reason he was separated from you for a while, so that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will repay it. I say nothing about your owing me even your own self. Yes, brother, let me have this benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I am writing to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. The word of the Lord. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Now large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and he turned and said to them, Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even life itself, cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me, cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not first sit down and estimate the cost to see whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to ridicule him, saying, this fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to wage war against another king, will not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000. If he cannot, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. The Gospel of the Lord.
Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be always acceptable in thy sight. O God, our strength and our redeemer. Another Sunday in ordinary time, another of Jesus' difficult lessons from Luke's Gospel. All of these lessons help us understand Jesus' vision for this world, but we don't read them just as difficult. When we read them, we also hope to see a bit of our own lives reflected there, and as we reflect upon them, they reveal a great deal more about us. Today we've just heard Now large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and he turned and said to them, Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even life itself, cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Over all the years that I have read or heard this passage, I have often wondered what happened to those crowds that came to follow him. One gets the feeling that the crowds were a lot smaller after this message sunk in. This message to the crowds just feels like one of the most difficult demands Jesus could make to ordinary people who have decided to travel with him and perhaps become his disciples. But I think thinning the crowds out was precisely one of the reasons Jesus said these things. It's not that he didn't appreciate crowds who came to him to learn or to be healed, or just to be given hope. It's that Jesus is now slowly making his way toward Jerusalem, knowing that there he will face great peril and likely lose his life. And in order to prepare his closest followers for what lies ahead, both for him as well as for them, he must lay it all on the line, as we say. No time for comforting words. It's all going to get very real, very soon. I think one of the more shocking parts of this message is its sheer countercultural nature, something that still comes across clearly even 2,000 years later. Let's start with the part that requires one to hate one's family. Now, when I'm looking for a good translation of the Greek, I turn to my Russian Bible, believe it or not. It got me through Greek class in seminary because it's such a wonderfully accurate mirror of the Greek. The word for hate is not the ordinary, everyday kind of hate that is a strong dislike, but instead it's something that's a kind of passion, a kind of perfection, what you might call a holy hatred. Just as interesting is the particular and, particular and seldom used verb that deals with love, the love we're supposed to have for God and for our neighbor. It's a love that's not romantic, but it also demands passion, perfection, a holy love. But why on earth was such a hatred necessary? Because of the hold one's family had on all aspects of your life back then, especially if you were not counted among the wealthy and powerful. You see, when you had very little to help you get by in life, one thing you normally had was your family. Remember the prodigal son? He brought a measure of shame onto his family and onto himself by the way he demanded his inheritance, then left to squander it. But in the end, it was the ties to his family that brought him home to beg for menial work. That's the cultural part of the issue with, whether, with either remaining true to one's obligations to one's family or following Jesus as a full-blown disciple. Not everyone who followed Jesus was up to the commitments that he required of his closest disciples. And here Jesus was making clear what he expected from those people who sought to become one of those. Modern English translations simply don't get it across that true discipleship demands a rejection of anything that distracts from Jesus' mission with the same passion and perfection that with which the great commands us, 
commandments call us to love. But at the same time, we need to remember that all Jesus taught and stood for was both largely countercultural, like rejecting one's obligations to one's family, and seen by those in power as completely seditious, deserving of a humiliating and painful public execution. That's why one also had to be willing to carry one's cross as a disciple, indicating a willingness even to be martyred if necessary. So let's say up front today, just to today, just like back then, with respect to all Jesus stood for, all he, that all he taught, his entire vision for our world, that there always are going to be followers as well as disciples. To build the kingdom of God, that Jesus sought to describe during his ministry, there must be many hands to do the work. And only some will have that single-minded passion belonging to his closest disciples. But where do we begin today to try, just to try to understand all of this in the world that we live in? Well, for all of us, it is worthwhile from time to time to reacquaint ourselves with our vows in baptism. What we find there is eerily like what Jesus was demanding of those who would follow him to become his disciples. Do you renounce Satan and all the spiritual forces of wickedness that rebel against God? Do you renounce the evil powers of this world which corrupt and destroy the creatures of God? Do you renounce all sinful desires that draw you from the love of God? Do you turn to Jesus and accept him as your savior? Do you put your whole trust in his grace and love? Do you promise to follow and obey him as your Lord? The baptismal covenant follows us up to build upon these vows, expanding them to add more modern calls for justice, humanity, reconciliation, and inclusivity. We're not expected to become perfect, just to be aware of what discipleship means. It comes with a kind of understanding that God's kingdom here on earth may never reach its perfection because it's being built by imperfect people who are struggling against those who would tear it all down. Our baptismal vows and covenant call us into that struggle and name those destructive forces that can distract us. There's another aspect of the whole good versus evil dynamic that is actually at the heart of this gospel passage though it might not be readily apparent. By this point in the life of Jesus, he, was, he has a very clear understanding of who his real enemies are. After all, he's been challenging them, openly describing their wickedness for such a long time. And the Judaism that, his life puts, that guides his life puts the individual at the center of God's world instead of the rich and powerful who come both from within the temple and all other halls of power. There are also some who openly refer to him as a Messiah, a title that by, the, by then had come to merely indicate the next person likely to be killed by Jewish or Roman authorities. But what Jesus understands about his adversaries is something that we can also see today among those whose primary motivations in life are wealth, power, violence, and oppression. It is a mindset that is completely focused on attaining such wealth and power, and at the same time, because they fear all others, they are also tightly focused on how to instill even greater fear, often using violence and oppression in those who might challenge them. Their antisocial greed and avarice fuel them to do things that can make them wealthy and powerful, but the more they attain, the greater their fear. Life becomes a single-minded struggle to survive. It's just the kind of mindset that Jesus knows he's up against and how it's likely to play out. That's why, for him and his disciples and followers, the struggle against the destructive forces he faces must be met with the same kind of single-mindedness. But 
based on the values that he has been teaching about all throughout his ministry. Jesus and those who followed him must also reject the kind of fear that drives the leadership among his foes. And, and so they have their work cut out for them. Love, compassion, hope, and justice must become more powerful than hatred, suspicion, suspicion greed, oppression, and violence. To succeed, Jesus knows that distractions, even from one's own family, are unacceptable. We like to think of our lives today as having some measure of purpose. And that purpose can be found in many places. Family, career, school, church, and a host of other things can give us some sense of purpose. But all of our actual work finding purpose is always balanced against our distractions. And they come from many different places, don't they? The distractions we choose to embrace tend to be those that offer us some measure of comfort, literally, literally distracting us <clears throat> from <clears throat> so that we're not very much aware of whatever unpleasantness surrounds us. The unpleasant distractions in our lives tend to be the kind we either deal with quickly so we can return to more comfortable activities or that we try to ignore altogether by procrastination. In Jesus' time, and especially among the poor, unpleasantness was not merely a distraction, but a way of life. They weren't merely distracted by the pain of hunger, the crushing weight of poverty, and the fears that come from a life under oppressive rule. They lived these things. In Jesus' time, family was one source of comfort, something that could be relied upon, and it's just that kind of distraction he knew would ultimately get in the way of his work and his goals. That's why he calls his closest followers to reject that as a distraction. In order to have any hope of changing anything, they had to be able to turn away from things that merely brought comfort and allow their lives and actions to be shaped by the hardships in the lives of those around them. Another source of comfort and stability in those days came from religion. And Jesus set about to remove the oppression religion brought into people's lives in order to hopefully change their daily lives as well. Knowing that this work will take time means that others must continue it after him. And this would require a lot of committed disciples. Jesus' call to discipleship rings through our baptismal vows and covenant. Our world is still largely ruled by those who use spiritually wicked and even evil power that is fueled by deeply sinful desires to gain and maintain power over the multitudes who still live desperate lives. The call to us is to choose to leave our bubbles of comfortable distraction from time to time in order to allow ourselves to be changed by the suffering and need that we can see around us. And when we are changed, we can in, ter in turn change the world one small action at a time. The cost to us is to willingly endure a measure of discomfort. The reward for this is what we have sought all along, following Jesus in discipleship. Amen.
I invite you to stand as you are able. Please join me in reaffirming our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father and the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For our salvation, our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate in the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified in the Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We pray for all people who know you and seek you. Send down your spirit, Lord, and fire us with your love. We pray for the world and all who work for justice and peace. Send down your spirit, Lord, and transform us with your hope. We pray for all creation and every living thing. Send down your spirit, Lord, and fill us with your grace. We pray for the lost, the forgotten, and those in any kind of need. Send down your spirit, Lord, and comfort us with your light. We pray for those who have died and all those who grieve. Send down your spirit, Lord, and turn our mourning into dancing. We pay, pray for the special needs and concerns of this congregation. In the Anglican cycle of prayer, we pray for the Anglican Church of Australia. In the diocesan cycle of prayer, we pray for all good works by the churches in our diocese. We pray in thanksgiving for the marriage of Eric White and Aliyah Jamil in our parish school, Mintana. We pray for those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit, and those in any trouble. Gloria Wing, Jackie, Jean, Rick, Azur, Naya, Seraphine, Barbara, Jin Berry, Dick Quigley, Tom Fortsheimer, John, Ian, Lisa Bulligan, Anna, Kristen, Carolyn, Frank Heisman, Derek, Shirley Shaw, Glenn Bowman, Carmen, Sean Moore, Richard and Diane Goodwin, Beverly, Kate Webster, Bob Geary, Sue Bolin, Sarah E. and family, Jennifer, Julie Arnheim, Henrietta C., Julie Hill and family, Alice Kachulna, and Mary, and Mary Lee Hilly. We pray for the people of Ukraine, and for all whose lives continue to be disrupted by the pandemic. We pray for the health and safety of girls and women across the country. We pray for the families and victims of mass shootings. We pray for those who have entered eternal life and for those who mourn them, mourn them especially Sterling Hill, Marjorie Keene, and Mary Lee Hilly. We give thanks for answered prayers, especially for Vadim Kochuna. I invite your own prayers of intercession or thanksgiving either spoken aloud or in the silence of your heart. Creator, spirit, and giver of life, pour out your spirit upon the whole creation, 
Come in rushing wind and flashing fire, in courage and inspiration, to turn the sin and sorrow within us into faith, power, and delight. For your love's sake. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins that we may receive God's grace. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, forgive you all your sins for our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Please stand as you are able. Those on Zoom, I invite you to now temporarily unmute yourselves. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Peace. Peace. Peace, everybody. Everyone. Peace, everyone. Peace. Peace to everyone on Zoom. <laughs> Be seated, please. Let's see. Announcements page. There should be a, uh, I think you have it in your bulletins. There's also an extra copy of the announcements in the back. Um, we're, we're having a series of what, we're, what are called wine and appetizer potlucks at several homes throughout the parish over the course of, oh, I guess we'd say late summer into fall. And the first one is going to be taking, taking place at Bob and Chris Stanfield's home. Now, um, we have data on that here, September 10th, 4 to 6 p.m., instructions and so forth. But it says RSVP here, and there's, there's a link there that's about as long as my sermon was. So uh, if you need, need that link and you can't find it or you can't type it in, either look in the uh, parish newsletter online or call up the uh, parish office and they'll email you a link. I think it's as easy as that, because we don't want anybody to miss out. Food Drive is coming next week. We also have a, a Rise Against Hunger meal packing service event, which will be taking place in conjunction with Mincana School. There's data on that. I think it's on the 17th. And then there's Rally Sunday, which is going to be the 18th, which is when we kick off a whole bunch of things. The choir comes back, right? The adult forum comes back. Um, and other activities will be, be started, restarted on that day. Also, um, we'll have quite a special event for Mr. Eric over there. He's, he will be celebrating, and we will be celebrating his 10th anniversary of being here with among us, doing such a wonderful job. And I understand that Ethan is, has written something for you? Yes, so um, Ethan Heyman, who was our organist here for many years and who I got to work with during his first few years um, here, uh, is coming back to share some, some special organ music, including a new piece he's written himself. Yeah, just a celebration of 10 wonderful years. So there are other announcements in here, but I'm sure you can read them as well as I can. So are there any here that are any more announcements or any other messages which are for the good of the parish this morning? Then, let us walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God.
All things come of you, O Lord. And of your own have we given you. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, for you are the source of light and life. You made us in your image and called us to new life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name.
Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you, in your mercy, sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you do this, drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit, to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also, that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament, and serve you, in unity, serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him, and with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. Gifts of God for the people of God. Holy food for holy people. This is God's table, and all are welcome here.
Let us pray. In union, O Lord, with your faithful people at every altar of your church where the Holy Eucharist is now being celebrated, we desire to offer to you praise and thanksgiving. We remember your death, Lord Christ. We proclaim your resurrection. We await your coming in glory. Since we cannot receive you today in the sacrament of your body and blood, we beseech you to come spiritually into our hearts. Cleanse and strengthen us with your grace, Lord Jesus, and let us never be separated from you. May we live in you and you in us, in this life and in the life to come. Amen. Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace, and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please stand as you are able for the blessing. May God bless you with discomfort and easy answers, half truths, and superficial relationships, so that you may learn to live deep within your heart. May God bless you with anger and injustice, oppression, and the exploitation of people, so that you may work for justice, freedom, reconciliation, and peace. May God bless you with tears to shed for those who suffer pain, rejection, disease, starvation, and war, so that you can reach out your hand to comfort them and to turn their pain into joy. May God bless you with just enough foolishness 
to believe that you can make a difference in this world, so that you can indeed do what others claim cannot be done. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you this fine day and forevermore. Amen. Let us go forth rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Alleluia, alleluia.